Welcome, everybody, to The Art of Faith. I'm Pastor Joshua Kapczynski and my co-host... Pastor Joel Fairley of... Doesn't matter, I'm just a pastor. First Baptist Church of Claremont. The Granite cute... Creek Community <laughs> Church. First Baptist, the cutest church. The sweetest, sweetest the cutest people. little church in the cutest little town Absolutely. on Route 66. It is on 66, huh? Yeah. That's... Yeah. It is about one block away. Uh, yes, yeah. one city block. Your church is beautiful. It's it, it really feels it, good. It, it, it has it, a it has has good bones. Uh huh. Good flow. Yeah. It fe- good feng shui. Yeah, I yeah. love the I love the uh, the I love the what our nod to stained glass. There's yeah. there's no imagery. In our stained glass, but it's we just have color. Whole, huh? We have a whole wall of blue, green, and uh, no, not green, um, blues and reds, and it's just I, I just really love, love the whole thing. It's a nice little church to be a part of, and and the pastor and the people are sweet. Well, it is, yes. Yeah. Okay, so our topic today is actually on worship. Yep. So let's, um, you know, the art of worship or whatever. Uh, but you have, you know, you manage a house of worship. Uh huh. Or we could say you curate a house of worship. Yeah, and that's that's how I like to consider myself as yeah. you know I'm a curator here, I'm putting people on display. But you know, and then so this is a house of worship too. Oh yeah, and they feel very different. They're, and yes, you know, you wouldn't know that ours was a church by driving by if you didn't if the sign wasn't out front. This is an office building, right? And. Your architecture says this is a church. This is a church. This is a house of worship. Yeah, it and, is. And I, I love that, and I appreciate that. I, I think that maybe culture will shift back to the value of architecture and what it is meant to do. There is um, something about my church that I, I really kind of like. It was it was um, the whole church started out in a home on the property just as house oh, I didn't and know that. I don't know if you've ever been to our fellowship hall yeah okay of course that's the original original church yep yeah. yeah. that was the original church and the glass doors that you go into off of Harrison uh-huh. that was the pulpit area oh wow that was that was weird and then so this was built probably um, 10 years later okay in the little, little a 60s the, and the thing I appreciate about it is that um, the the different things the different elements they used like we have that big cross over the baptistry mm-hmm. and it's all gold mosaic and i and i and i just love that i love this that you know retro style yeah. of things yeah and no it's i it's it's just really neat yeah thank you for not screwing it up yeah you know you get some <laughs> You know, some young pastor in there, like, you know, he'd probably take all, all the good stuff. We're right? going to get rid of that. Yeah. You know, we're not, we're not. It's, it's, we need to keep our, on our, our homage. Yeah. And, um, and, and it has a real mid century feel to it, it. Does. And I just love it. And, and I love uh, a colleague of ours. Um, he calls the Jesus on the, Facing. Jedi Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. He's not <laughs> Is that the what you call it? Yeah, Jedi yeah. Jesus. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, it's, yeah, I don't think that that's a new thing. I think the, the community calls it the Jedi Jesus. The Jedi Jesus. So we'll make sure we put a picture of that up. Oh, there. I'll make sure I'll yeah. have that. Because, yeah. He's great, though. It's great. Oh, it's stylized. Very, it's very, very stylized. It's, and, and it, it, it's wonderful. And he, he looks like, I mean, it's powerful. Yeah. It's a powerful. Oh, Jesus. I mean, yeah. yeah. And it says he lives. Yeah. Yeah. And he, so you're going to walk by him and he's going to pull a Jedi mind trick on yeah. you. Yeah. Come to church. Come to church. You want to come it. to church. <laughs> Have you ever thought about like upgrading and remodeling? Like you wouldn't tear the pews out, would you? Um, no, but we'd get, I don't, I don't think I would do yeah. that. I think. Um, if I could, uh, cushions need to be redone. Redone. And, yeah. I, I would like to see them attached. They're not attached. Yeah, they slide off, huh? They slide off, and um, buttons pop off it. Yeah. There's a lot of work, and also, if I was to do anything with the sanctuary inside, I would, I would um, make 
the balcony up there, a uh, true balcony, and mm. put a staircase up to a balcony. And there's a way to do it from the inside of the sanctuary yeah. pretty easily. Pretty easily. But yeah, if I had, if there was anybody out there who wanted to give us a good gift, we would renovate it and look, make it look sharp. Yeah. Um, we still have an organ, but it died. It your organ died? Yeah. Yeah, Mrs. Hodges can't can't oh. make it work anymore. And can you get somebody to come in and there's a big the guy, the big guy that she's been using said we'll probably cut this. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> the guy that she's been using said. Um, I've I've done everything I can to keep it going, and so All right. when it happens again, don't call me. There's nothing I can do. You know. All right, we'll get you to Oregon. All right. Um, so I have uh, I have uh, brought up some images of what anthropologists and archaeologists consider the world's first church. Or the first temple, okay. the oldest one that we have okay. that we can say that this is, this is a house of worship, and um, well, I mean, we usually don't steer away from controversy uh, on this podcast, um, but the age of it is very problematic, in that it it's dated to eleven thousand okay. years ago. Okay, so it doesn't fit the the old. Excuse me. The New Earth no, uh, creation theory. It doesn't. It doesn't fit the Old Testament timeline. It doesn't fit the Old Testament timeline. Um, specifically, if you believe in a six literal day creation period. Yeah. Um, so I'm old Earth. I think that the six days are um, symbolic, and you know, open for interpretation. So. Mm-hmm. A day it could be a million years, so that's it's just I don't I don't get hung up on stuff like that. Yeah, I, I yeah for me and I you know first of all, if I go to heaven and the Lord says you know it was you screwed six days, this up, yeah. you know it was six days. Yeah, I go okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think he's gonna send us to hell you if know. we get this one wrong. <laughs> yeah, I um, you know it was I th- there's a part of me that that keeps gnawing at me is that is is the speed of light yeah and how long it takes for the stars that are way i mean we're seeing stars that are dead yeah yeah that's for the first time that's bizarre and that's bizarre yeah you know and so i think in one sense that kind of obliterates the the space-time continuum yeah Yeah. you know and the idea so that's just me yeah but so i don't i don't have a problem with that yeah um I think the only question that comes up is if this is the first temple, what were they worshiping? Yeah, we don't know. Okay, so it's called Gobekli Tepe. It's in uh, Turkey, so it's okay. in the area uh, where Noah landed his boat. Okay, uh, <laughs> what did you call it? Noah it, land. Noah landed his boat. Oh, okay. So, yeah, it's where the ark. You know, you could say it's close to where the ark of the of the animals where it, where it come to ground. Yeah. Um. Okay, before I before I show you pictures, uh-huh. uh, back to anthropologists and archaeologists, uh, historians. Uh, they 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 taught you and me in high school and in college that organized religion, if not religion itself, is a byproduct of the agricultural revolution. Okay. So when when humans first domesticated wheat and first began to farm when they transitioned from being hunter gatherers into farming farmers and herdsmen Mm -hmm. then religion um, blossomed and exploded out of that discovery that we could farm Mm -hmm. and the the logic and the reasoning of it is that okay so now we're now we're farming now we're growing uh, human nature is human nature, and we build in hierarchical systems okay. of who gets to control the grain, uh, who gets to distribute it, uh, who gets the leftovers. And so, out of this, you know, desire of you know who's the 
who's the alpha dog here. Mm -hmm. Hence, humans created a system to manage and distribute and administrate the grain. And that system is called religion. Um, okay. And, and to be fair, we do have great examples of it. Uh, South America and, you know, the, the organization of corn, maize, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. their whole systems were built around that. We see um, we're, we're, we offer sacrifices to the Lord of our grain. We see mm -hmm. that in the Bible. So mm -hmm. uh, Abel offered his sacrifice, or, excuse me, Cain offered mm -hmm. his sacrifice of grain to the Lord. And so, you know, it is fair to say that, well, yeah, we can see how they came to that conclusion that religion is the result of agriculture. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the big, you know, anthropological idea that has now, this has nothing to do with Christianity, it has nothing to do with religion, this is now historical fact. Now they have to literally rewrite the history books um, because we know that, that that's not true anymore. And this this site proves it. So let okay. me let's bring up the first photo. And if you're listening, you gotta go to the you gotta go to uh, the YouTube page and watch it because these pictures are really important. So this is what we believe the first temple was. Um, it gets in a site called Golbeke Tepe, eleven thousand years ago, maybe even older. Um, it's hard to tell the scale of these structures. But the middle pillars and the surrounding pillars are some of them are 25 feet tall, wow. ginormous monoliths. This predates the temple or the pyramids of Giza. This predates Stonehenge by thousands of years. Wow, thousands of years older than Stonehenge. So monolithic architecture. So this took place prior to the domestication of wheat. Okay. Prior to the invention of pottery. So this is pre-pottery. Pre-pottery one, pre-pottery two. They, were, they weren't throwing pots at this time. Okay. Quite possibly this was prior to even the discovery of the wheel. Um, you know, we don't know if they had wheels, but, you know, they prior they told us that we didn't invent the wheel until 5000 BC. So, so yeah, this is super, super. Okay, I mean, look, look, they... They they're doing they got roller technology. Yeah, so they're you know rolling stuff on logs. That's what they're saying that they did. You know they don't know how they move the stuff. Okay. You know it's kind of the same type of you know mysteries surround this site. That there's yes. Yeah, so there's no evidence as to how they did it. How they did it. And there's no language, so we have no way of knowing who they were, what they believed, how they communicated, and nothing's on the nothing's on the walls. No, not 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 as far as any graphs or. Uh, okay. hieroglyphics or anything like that that we would be able to recognize. No, no, no patterns or no systematic, um, at least that we can interpret for communication. Was there an indication of a roof over this structure? Yeah, quite possibly. So we okay. think that they would have covered it and um, most of the archaeologists are in agreement that these were constructed for worship. So I did a sermon on the idea that we were created for worship. I use these images for that. Uh -huh. um, but they were worshiping. And here, here, again, they, there is no, they weren't farming. No. So prior, prior thought, again, is that, that worship or religion served a utilitarian purpose. Right, uh -huh. the, the utilitarian purpose of worship was for the administration of grain or the administration of resources. So it served a purpose. It had a bottom line, and so what is stumping everybody is that there is no utilitarian purpose for what they were doing. They were just doing it. Okay, is there is there a site? Um, because in this picture, in this illustration, I don't know if it's, they just took artistic license and yeah. to the left of that, they put a, you know, they put another structure being built. No, there's that. there's hundreds of these. This is eight. This is acres and acres and acres of this stuff. 
What's fascinating about Gold of these of these structures? Yeah, they've only excavated ten percent of this site. They discovered it in '95. Oh, wow. A German archaeologist discovered it, and so it just it it's just now kind of coming into popularity. They don't have time to rewrite the history books yet, but it's just now kind of coming to light as the importance of it. And what's fascinating about this site, so you can't date stone. So, you know, we've got this really cool column right here. I'm telling you it's from the 16th century, but I can't prove it. Okay. Because it's stone. Yeah. Um, you can't date it. You can't carbon date it. You know, well, maybe, then how do they come up with the fact that is it because of the depth of, of the um, excavation? Yeah. Well, this is another big, giant freaking mystery on this site. For okay. whatever reason, these people decided to cover up the site after they were, after they were done worshiping it. Okay. So they backfilled it. So it's like, it was like a time capsule that, again, we don't know why they did it, but they would use it. They, they built these structures. Uh, they were functioning temples, and for whatever, whatever reason, they purposely covered them up. And so that's and then the seal. And there's no that, there, no. There's no skeletal or there's mummified. Very, there's very few. There's some burials, not a whole lot. Uh, the other bizarre thing about it is there's very little indication of uh, domestic life. Okay. So they they weren't living here. They're still hunter gatherers. They're still running through the woods, you know, wow. killing foxes and eating berries. Wow. And but for some reason, they decide to come together and make these things. Um, so, you know, relatively to the size of the site and the, or you know, how elaborate it is, there is no huge indication that this is the first city. This is the first temple, but they haven't created cities yet. Okay. Um, but you know they're living communally, and they're you know they're celebrating. You know they're eating animals, so there are animal bones. Fascinating thing about this site: there's not a, there's no indication of warfare. Wow. There's no there's no weapons. There's no warfare weapons for killing people. Of course, there's going to be weapons for killing animals. Yeah. But there's no ceremonial warfare weapons like in you know the the Iron Age or yeah yeah. You know, so it's just it's wow. so it's very unique and. It's, it's super exciting that we found it. So, but yeah, we know the exact age of it because they buried it. And so we do have carbon dating on the exact age of this place. Okay. Okay. Um, you well, know, when we're, when we're excavating sites in Israel, I mean, it's not only a puzzle piece, it's like a haystack that these archaeologists have got to go and unpack and figure things out. The number one dating method in you know, modern archaeology is pottery. So they're able to take the style and the, the structure of pottery. They've got all this pottery shards all over the yeah. place, and they're able to date strata based up primarily off of pottery, but they can't do it off of stone. So, yeah, I, I dug in high in college. So I, was, I spent a semester in... Wow. Yeah, so it's fun stuff. Okay, so it's, yeah, we don't know what the heck is going on. Uh, we don't know why they built it. We don't know who they were worshiping. So we can just use our imagination and wow. say, hey, it's, it's uh, Noah's kids and they're worshiping God. But we don't know. They could be, you know, they could be worshiping some other foreign god or animal god, spirit animal. And, yeah. you know, I like to think that they're good people, but I don't know. Maybe they were eating each other. Who knows? But <laughs> <laughs> we just don't know. Yeah. And again, that's the fun part about it, but highly complex. And so. And it would take a high level of organization to erect these things. Yeah. Because it's all human power, right? Oh. oh. All right. So that's the overall look. Look, Let's look at some of the detail of the site, how, how pretty they are. Okay. Oh, okay. So this mm -hmm. is the true. Yeah. This, these are actual photos. Uh, we might go back to the site. And, are, and there's hieroglyphs? They're, they're pictograms of animals. Pictograms. Um, so on the left, you know, you have buzzards and some birds and scorpions, uh -huh. uh, boars. There's little boars in there, little cranes and egrets. Yeah. Uh, there's some foxes. Some some of the carvings have like um, wow. uh, uh, bulls or oxen of some sort. Uh -huh. What's fascinating about it is some of these animals are extinct in this region now, 
And so that's another reason. That's how we, that's how else we know how to date it. That it is eleven thousand. Wow. So basically, at the end of the ice age, because okay. even the the animals are lining up to the to the right period. Wow. Yeah. Uh, what's fascinating? Okay, on this pillar to the left, above the the buzzards, and they're not bad buzzards, right? They're they're, no, they're decent. They're, yeah. But we don't know what those handbags are. I made a really bad joke when I preached on this, and I said, well, that proves that women were here because we've got some handbags. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't go over too well. Yeah. Uh, but we don't know what those are, and there's been <laughs> lots of conspiracies, and you know, they're, they're magic bags, and we see similar bags in Assyrian art. Um, yeah, we don't know what the heck they are. Wow, and, and you know, and then there's other conspiracy theories all the way down from Atlantis to ancient aliens, of course. So, um, all right, let's go to the next slide and let Joel sink, let it. So that's kind of. So that's a that's a a completed excavation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh boy, that's pretty. And there's there's. They don't know how many of these there are, but there's a lot of them. That they haven't even got it. Um, of course, in this is probably a fair guess. You know that these were <laughs> could have been used for mapping the stars. Uh -huh. They haven't been able to figure out the method of doing that, mm -hmm. and that they do believe that they were enclosed. So one method is kind of one one idea is it was like a, you know, a star map kind of like. Uh -huh. Stonehenge. Yeah. Um, but the other idea, which is probably where I'm heading towards it, is that they were enclosed and they were, um, you know, you would go into this temple kind of like you would go into modern church expecting to experience God. Wow. Yeah. And so kind of like almost a portal to another world. Well, I'm impressed that they harness the power of the UV light. In yeah. 1, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> All right. Let's go to the next one. <laughs> You're funny. Okay, so that's a better idea. Wow. Closer picture. And then, uh, you know, they, there's that uh, a big stone, standing stone with a, almost a perfect circle that they carved. Like, how the frick did they do that? And um, uh, the... Again, anthropologists, they, they, there's a lot of guesswork, but they think that the hole is another symbolic uh, interpretation of going into the spirit world. You have to, you know, like a, like a doorway mm -hmm. into something else. Yeah, they, they don't know what they're talking they, they, they have no idea. They're making, they're making stuff up. But, um, you know, the, the material itself is, is amazing. Again, these are 25 feet tall. So, like, wow. the, the height of... Uh, the atrium here at our church, the the height of the, you know, close to the top of your steeple, not your steeple, but the your, yeah, close yeah, to the top yeah, of your yeah. your a frame, yeah, the at, apex, yeah, at your church. Wow. Okay. Right. Um, now, are these? Um, let, let, do, do they put the, the 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 Milky Way in there just just I, for artistic yes, license? Yes, I'm sure they do. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm sure it was an overexposed picture. So. Okay, I was I was gonna say that, be, but or it was maybe it's Photoshop. I don't know. It looks uh, pretty yeah. to me. But <laughs> yeah, I think, it's probably I, Photoshop. I think somebody's taking artistic license, but but man, so I'm trying to. I'm so this is so there's something. This is responding, or they are responding. If, as you said, so this is worship. Yeah. Then at the very heart of a people, there is something that is drawing them. To worship. Calling them. Right. To, to worship. Um, now, I don't know if they were worshiping the, the images. Uh, probably. I mean, that would probably be the, you know, there, again, there's animals on everything. Yeah. So they could have been an animal worship type of a experience. Well, okay. So, so let me ask you, let me just pull this out. Yeah. So, um, it seems like, it seems like 
man, human beings, when they worship in their places of worship, they've always decorated. Yeah. They've always decorated the mm-hmm. worship edifices mm-hmm. from the thing. And um, and so to, I don't know, to to embellish, but if we were to have, so for example, we go, you go into churches, modern churches, the cathedrals, yeah. you see... You see statues of the saints and right, your statues right. of the apostles and yep. the statues of of all these. But nobody, especially in, in Christian cathedrals, nobody would say, Oh, you're you're worshiping an idol. Yeah. Yeah. Your idol. Well I, it's just an enhanced so my my thinking is yeah. they're loving their world. Yeah, I that's I mean again, I'm I'm and they and you know, and we want to we want to decorate our, yeah. and I'm decorating with what we see and know. Yeah, and I, and I think, okay, so let's just use our imagination and okay. say that I yeah I'm yeah, good at that yeah no, <laughs> <laughs> but let's just say that this is uh, Noah's kids right yeah it's Noah's descendants yeah there was no Bible no the the term Yahweh hadn't been used yet no uh, there were no Ten Commandments no there was nothing there was nothing. Besides knowing that there's a creator. And they were and, on the ark with animals yeah. for, for quite a long right. time. You know, also, incidentally, during this time period, we do know that there were major global floods. It doesn't fit the biblical timeline of the flood narrative. But this is, you know, during the Ice Age, there was a big, giant meteor impact. Uh, we know that... It, the big giant meteor impact that that shook the whole world. Mm-hmm. That you know, either these people were a part of it, or these people survived it and made these things. But there was a big giant flood mm-hmm. uh, all over the place, mm-hmm. and it's you know, it is definitely fair to say because we have flood myths from every culture. It happened. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's really close to this time period. Okay, and it is just interesting that there's animals everywhere that they're that they're creating with. So, again, it's just, this is all in the realm of imagination. We can't prove a stinking thing, but it is fascinating to the, me. I think the point that I think your point is is that at the very heart of this particular civilization. There was a there was a desire to reach beyond their own experience, yes. to, to embrace something greater than themselves. Yes. And I think the argument could be made for that. If that is worship, if if worship at its at at its um, lowest common denominator yeah. is that we are trying we are reaching something beyond. That it, that is greater than who we are, yeah, and literally to touch the face of God, and that's what I think that they're trying to do. They're, I like that. I really, I mean, they're moving themselves into a different state that is that's beyond their day to day. That's even beyond nature, mm-hmm. right? So they're going beyond nature by creating something that does not exist in nature. Mm-hmm. Um, Let's go to the next slide. Little foxes. Mm-hmm. They call these things T-shaped pillars, okay? Yeah. Um, the next one. Okay, we looked at that one already. as the handbag one. Okay, this one you're going to love. So this one has a leopard on there. This animal is, is extinct in this yeah. region, but it was an Ice Age animal that was running around eating stuff back in the day. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Wow. It, that's... Fascinating. And so what's great about this, it, it's high relief. And you know what that is. So they didn't glue this guy on there. No, they stone, yeah. They took away every bit of stone around that. Yeah. All the way down to the ground. Yeah. And that's where they wanted the leopard. You know, and like, why wow. did they put it there? Like, I don't know. We don't know. And these T-shaped pillars, they're all also high relief. So they didn't, there's not, you know, a, a T standing on top of it. They carved it out that yeah. way. Yeah. And they did this with very rudimentary tools. Oh, absolutely. There's no iron that, there was no... It was rock on rock. Rock on rock. Yeah. 
And then, I mean, look at that little guy. He's a pretty great looking leopard. Yeah, he is. All right. So, um, in these places, was there, did they find any evidence of an altar, so to speak? That, the closest one was that previous picture with the round hole in okay. the middle. That's in the middle. Okay. Or it's in like a, well, this is kind of fascinating. So, if it was all enclosed, it's kind of uh, in, in uh, concentric circles. Uh huh. So you're going from in from one circle to the next circle, yeah. and then there was that portal, that that round hole, going into the very center, or the holy of holies, if you mm-hmm. will. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the outer courts, and then the the, the inner yeah, court. The illustration and, that you first we first looked at, um, it was, I noticed that there's only one way in. Yeah. And it doesn't go directly into the center. No. It, it, you had to journey to the center. Yeah. Yeah, it's... Wow. Yeah. All right, let's go to the next one. All right. So, okay, there's those oxen on the right and, you know, some of the little handbags. And Okay, so do you... You grew up in this area, right, Joel? I um I I grew up in the, the other side of the foothill corridor, Pasadena. Okay. Do you remember Tasty Freeze? Sure. You remember the logo for Tasty Freeze? Yeah. A big giant T with a face on it, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. A, an abstracted, stylized, anthropomorphic human. Uh huh. That's what these things are. Wow. So. That T-shaped pillar, that is an abstracted person. That's a head. And you've got that swooping thing. Well, that's his arm. So he's literally holding this fox. These are all people that they've carved on. Okay. And let's go to the next one. Oh, I love that. Yeah. So if you can look closely, he's wearing a belt the little U shape yeah. and there's a fox loincloth that, yeah. that's covering him and then he too has arms that wrap around and his fingers come around the corners like that so they're hum- they're they're humanoid human like figures uh-huh shaped in these T's and they're abstracted uh-huh. and i mean look at the right angles too by the way for a bunch of uh cavemen basically yeah you know they're carving in this level of sophistication yeah you know again these are cavemen these are hunter gatherers wow um the, there's like symbolism maybe like there's some h's on his belt and a u's on his belt you know again we to push things into conspiracy theory we'll, we can find h's in other civilizations and we don't know we don't know what they're for but we see some of these similar patterns and different uh-huh. things even the moai in Easter Island, those big giant statues in Easter Island, uh-huh. they too, even though they're a little more humanoid, uh, but they too had these little arms that kind of wrap around and their fingers wrap around their their, their fronts and their stomachs and they have similar loincloths, mm-hmm. similar the way that they look very similar. Now there's thousands of years between them, but again, that's where we get into Atlantis theories, right? Yeah, Which I would. I love to go to Atlantis and think about that kind of stuff. But yeah, it, like scientifically, we can't do it. But in the realm of imagination, oh, it's, it's why not? It's so super fun. Yeah, I, I mean, but there is some really weird, you know, similarities in the artistic styles between some ancient cultures here and then, again, even in South America. But yeah, okay, we don't know. But anyway, abstracted human figures. Used in these in these structures. Okay. Uh, can we go to the next one. But they are also making these. Making what? Yeah. Pretty pretty close to anatomically correct humans. Uh huh. So one of the questions that I've heard presented to the head archaeologist at the site is why were they making these T shaped pillars, um, abstract humans? when they could easily make humans look like humans. And he's, you know, the head archaeologist is like, I don't know, because they could? Because they wanted to? 
He's like, I can't answer that. Just know that well, they, they, they were making taking artistic license. And yeah. What's wrong with that? Yeah. You know, they could they could make something look like a human, but they chose to make something look like a big giant tea tasty mm-hmm. freeze guy. Mm-hmm. And it's just <laughs> I just think I just love that. Yeah. But yeah, this is you know, several human shaped figures, so statues like artistic this. license is about eleven thousand years old. At least, yeah. <laughs> At least. Yeah. So this is when I guess you could say modern art started, right? <laughs> Abstract well, art. I yeah. Um Is that it, Luke? Do you have any more? That's it. Okay. So, yeah, I did two two major ideas that we were made to worship. Yeah. So, and it doesn't have to serve a utilitarian purpose. Like we don't have. There's nothing on on the bottom line of it. There's other than the the um, innate um, desire to worship. Yeah. There was. It it seems like um, see it's it's really interesting. What what would happen? What would happen if we burned our churches down? Yeah, yeah. Or we never invited people to church. Yeah, they're gonna find a way to worship. I think I think yeah. God's gonna break through. Yeah, I do too. And and he's and I think that's the. That's the natural way to do it. I was watching a, you know, I was I was just watching, you know, I I don't even want to say it because I don't want to get into the weeds of it. Yeah. Um. But I was watching something on um Netflix, not Netflix, Paramount. Anyway, I was watching something on TV, and and one of the characters said something extremely profound. And this character went from a transformation of being super, super evil to super, super helpful. And they made a statement that, um, and I and I love this, we're the guardians at the gate. Mm. And they played this, and they played the music, and I and tears came to my eyes, and I immediately just went to the Lord in my heart and my thought. Because just something very profound and good was said, yeah. And and I and I think how do we how do we as as followers of Jesus help people tap into what is there, what is all around us? How do we take the oughta shouldas and couldas yeah. off worship? Because clearly, it was around a while. Yeah. I, I think, I mean, this is where you and I have to do like some soul searching on, on how we present the gospel and how we worship, you know, how we present worship or making places of worship. You know, I, I think there is a, a balance that we need to find mm-hmm. when we are you know, curating a space for people to come in Mm -hmm. to to worship. Now, I'm probably more guilty of this than you, but, you know, in my worship settings, I'm going to be, well, how many people came to church today? How much money was in the offering basket? Um, You know... No, guilty is charged. Don't... Okay, all right. Well, I mean, so we're measuring, right? We're making sure that we're producing fruit. Um, you know, even in even in some of the creative things that you and I both do in our ministries, mm-hmm. you know, deep down inside, we're like, "What's the payoff here? Like, what's what's going to be the return mm-hmm. on our? What's going to be the ROI? What's going to be the return on our investment of our, you know, expenditure here?" Mm-hmm. And uh, I think, what are we doing this for? Yeah, and I think we need to get away from that. You know. I, I think that, you know, I'm I, I am admitting I'm guilty of this, like just of building a consumer Christian culture mm-hmm. and the way that we frame uh, our messages, like I got something for you, right? Mm-hmm. You know, you come to church on Sunday, we'll fix your marriage. Mm-hmm. Come to church on Sunday, you'll have a breakthrough. 
come to church on Sunday, you know, you'll get something out. You're going to get something out of it, right? Mm -hmm. You'll get a you'll get an ROI for your mm -hmm. <laughs> your, your your time here. And I don't. I think that that's. I'm not saying that that's wrong, but a constant steady diet of saying you're a consumer Christian mm -hmm. is toxic. I think we're. I think the church is paying a price for that. Yeah, I, I, I think. I, yeah, it, yeah. You know, and so I think that you know, instead of presenting the question, "What can God do for you this this Sunday?" I think probably the better question is, or a question that we should ask, is that what did you and God create this week? What can you bring as your symbolic sacrifice? What did you create with your life? The time. What is your, what is your monolith to yeah. the Lord? Yeah, yeah. I, I think that. Yeah. You know, I think I'm gonna probably start asking that question. Like, what did you create this week? What good thing did you create? The, and in, the, in, that in you partnership can, with the Lord. Yeah. The, this is you know this is your Sabbath. That's great. This is your time to reflect on the good things that God has done. Yeah. And instead of saying, I think it's awesome. So anyway, I I, um, I, I just want to you know. Yeah, I. You know, it's really interesting that when we, um, you know, there's that statement in um, in Revelation. In, in the idea that at, at the end of days, yeah, every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess yeah. that Jesus Christ is Lord. Because they they it, can't help it. They can't help it. Yeah, and that's and I think I think we as a church perhaps our job is to create a prelude to, yeah. to that. Is to our worship is a prelude. We 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 have to create a space for Jesus to walk in and to do what he wants to do with us yeah and um and to um see another thought when i was when I was thinking about this is is who's to say who's to say during this time that some of this some of the architect some of the things that are going on in this site are not are not a response to could they be a response to a theophany uh, yeah i think so to to where where god came down and in in human form sure and and was there with them yeah and and we know that he did that in scripture absolutely so he did it with joshua he did it with Abraham. He did it with Jacob. Jacob. He did it with no. um, Shadrach, Meshach, no. and Abednego. I mean, yeah, those, those are some. And so, if he was able to do that, um, pre-book, pre-language, pre-language. I mean, he, I guarantee you, he was dipping into humanity. Did did um, did God step completely away from creation? Yeah. When um, after the fall, yeah, no, clearly, I think, not. I think his hand was. Well, I mean, you know, you could you, you could ease like so. I believe that you know, you know, this site was created very close to, relatively close from our perspective to Noah. Noah was just a regular guy. He was just one of these people, but God encountered him and talked to him. And probably in theophanies, like what other base would they have? You know, they didn't have no objective truth. They didn't have any preachers. You know, for us to um, um, to make it simple, can you give a great definition of what a theophany is? Yeah. Okay. So, theophanies in the Old Testament, it's controversial. We have brothers and sisters that will not agree with us on this interpretation, okay. but. Um, so the but they're not here, are they? They're not here. I mean, they can listen <laughs> and they can comment. Yeah. But um, uh, the first, I believe, was Theophanies with Abraham uh, when he encounters three people and um, they tell him to move on, but he gives them a worship offering mm -hmm. and two of the guys vanish and one of them is being recognized as being the angel of the Lord. Yeah. And so, the... the um, the term itself describes a um, God, a pre-incarnated, yeah. 
God um, in the flesh. God in the flesh. Yeah. Some some people would say a pre-incarnated Christ. Yeah, it, yeah and that that's that's my that's my interpretation. That's my belief. Uh -huh. So so literally, Abraham was talking to a pre-incarnated Christ. Uh, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel are thrown into the fiery fur furnace, and, and Nebuchadnezzar says, "Oh my gosh, I'm seeing you know the four men." Yeah, four men, and one of them looks like the Son of God. And so you know, it's either an angel or it's the Son of God. So for whatever reason, this pagan recognizes it as the Son of yeah. God. And so I believe that um, Joshua, um, Joshua five when he's talking about he's moving in he's moving out of the desert he's moving into the promised land right crossing the jordan they're 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 crossing the jordan uh they make a huge it's a huge transitional moment and in that transitional moment from uh purification and purging into promise mm -hmm. he encounters and again the scriptures say the angel of the lord mm -hmm. wielding a sword Mm -hmm. And Joshua confronts him, doesn't recognize him. Yeah. And said, Who are you? Are you for us or are you against us? The response is absolutely terrifying because the angel of the Lord says, Neither. I am the I am the commander of the angel armies. Yeah, and, you don't and then at that at that statement, for whatever reason, Joshua's eyes opens up and he bows down and he recognizes him as the Lord. Right. And so we believe that that is another incarnation of Jesus Christ, that Joshua encountered Jesus wow. in that moment, because it's, again, it's a theophanies. Wow. And so uh, there's, a, there's a few of those. Um, Jacob is another one. Jacob wrestled with the yeah. angel of the Lord yes. all night long. Uh, most Jews believe that uh, Jacob is wrestling with the Lord. Uh -huh. You know, and so we... I would, you know what the thing is, is, is knowing how personal yeah. that God is with us, of course he did. Yeah, of course he did. Yep. Why? Because he could. Because he could. And and yeah. So I, I think easily. I mean, again, we have to use our imagination. We have no proof at all. But why wouldn't God encounter these hunter gatherers in their everyday life? You have a saying that I know I'm obsessing about, and that is what God says to us, mm -hmm. which is, "You are." Finish the state. Finish the statement. You are worthy. Yeah, you are worthy. You're worthy. We are and, worthy to have. Yeah. And the opposite of that is the tool that the enemy uses yeah. and whispers in our ear almost every moment of every day. You are not worthy. Yeah. And I, and I so when we're ministering to people, uh huh, that's the message that we're trying to get across. Yeah. Like you're worthy to hear this. You're worthy to be saved you're worthy for transformation yes you're worthy to be called a son or a daughter yes. of god yes and i that i think that message is timeless yeah i think that these people were worthy to have an encounter with god too yeah you mentioning the 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 three beings the three figures mm -hmm. that came to see abraham yeah um do you remember a long time ago the movie the bible it was it was yeah. created by John Houston, yeah. and George C. Scott played yeah, Abraham. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I loved the artistic rendering of that visit of the three things. I don't remember. I'll have to revisit it. Okay, the yeah. three when they came, yeah, and um, there were three of them, and they had one had a dark robe, one had a um, a light robe, and one mm -hmm. had a, a a yellowish robe or something like that, and. They they use the actor Peter O'Toole for each person of those characters whenever they showed the face and when they yeah. showed the face of the one in the red robe or the yellow robe it was always Peter O'Toole. It was it was a really really cool effect. And that's where communion took place too, right? Is that in that instant? Didn't that what communion? Was he offered communion at that moment, or was that with um, Melchizedek? That was with Melchizedek. I think it was with Melchizedek yeah, yeah, yeah. in that. Yeah. yeah. In that. Which very well could be another theophany, yeah. Theophany, yeah, that yeah. it was Jesus yeah. who was the chief priest. Yeah. Um, so I have a question for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
when in your life did worship change for you? When did it stop being something you had to do and was compelled to do as a pastor's kid mm -hmm. and become something that it was your choice? Do you remember a moment? Was there a moment? And, or was the time when, okay, this is different from when I was? Yeah, it goes all the way back. Um, it goes back to childhood. Okay. And it goes back primarily to experience. Okay. So uh, the transition was learning about God through Sunday school mm -hmm. and all of that um, to full-blown encounter. Mm-hmm being in the presence of a powerful God, shaking mm -hmm. in your boots. So I remember that vividly, and I think that that's the key for me. Now, I can't say that that happens every Sunday. I wish that it did, but it doesn't. Yeah. But that's like, that's my, that's my mark. Like, I'm striving for that. Mm -hmm. I don't have to have it. Like, I don't have to have an experience in order to realize that God loves me. But man, would I love another one. You know, and so yeah. it just, uh, that that's my... Well, there always is, you know, the bottom line is, I think the, uh, more than anything else, we don't worship God out of experience. Yeah. We worship God out of faith. Yeah. And we go there, even though we don't feel it, even though we may not sense it, even though there's a thousand things going on in our head yeah. at the time of worship. That's we step into the place of faith every time. Every time. Absolutely. And with and 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 I think that there are strength muscles. There's those are yeah, faith yeah, yeah. muscles but that we strengthen. For sure. for sure. And and so that it does become it does become um muscle memory. Yeah, I agree. And I think that, that like that's where I am at right now in my discipleship process is strengthening my faith muscle or tuning my ear to hear the the Lord's voice better because he's speaking I just you know he's speaking all my, the time he's speaking all the time and the, yeah. the the problem is not on his side the problem is on my side and the interpretation of what he is saying um so yeah he's always present so so I love that. Yeah, I love the challenge that that you have set before us. You put it in the context of your people. Is what is what are you? Let's put that again. Say that again. What the tuning of the ear to hear? The Lord no, the, the when you said, uh, "What are we doing? What's the Lord doing with you?" Yeah. Is that is that kind of what you're saying? Instead of. Instead of, I think what that's you, a. What that's, have you? Yeah. What have you created with the Lord this week? I think that's a. I, yeah. That's a great change to. What have you done for the Lord lately? Yeah. yeah we don't want to say that. Like, what have you? You know, because yeah. what, that, that, that what on matter. earth are you doing for heaven's sake? Yeah, that's going to imply guilt. Yeah. And, and motivation. But I love. By guilt. I love that. Yeah. What have you created this what you, week? What are you and God creating together? Yeah. And again, I think that the whole. The, and I think this is important. The created thing doesn't have to have a payoff. It just no. needs to be pretty. No, there is. You know, is that, so there, yeah. You know the what have you done for the Lord this week? Is how many people did you lead to the Lord this week? What's what's your? You know, yeah. What did you know? Or how many how many chapters in the yeah. Bible have you read? Or books yeah. in the Bible have you read yeah. th this week? I, I just I like I think we need to get away from that. And yeah, I think so too. You know, we're not saying. Stop yeah. reading the Bible. Read the Bible. Yeah, you know, but it, but not as a measuring stick, and so yeah. that you can you know give yourself a brownie mm -hmm. button at the end of the day, um, like I get when I accomplish three hundred. Why I do to myself when I when I've accomplished my goal of writing three hundred words. <laughs> in, in yeah. My book. Well, yeah. Well, you hit your goal, and you hit. It feels you can feel good about yourself. Yeah, I feel but, good. You know, yeah. I, but in spiritual matters, like I just don't. It's I, it's. You know, it really is in spiritual, it's really interesting. It may be, it can be very simple Yeah. as, as just, and I think that's just what Jesus was talking about in, um, the, in the Sermon on the Mount, consider the lily of the field. Yeah. Right. Consider it, the birds of the air. Yeah. What, what good, like what 
payoff do they have? No, they're just pretty. They're just pretty. They don't have they're a payoff. Just because. They're, they're not. He created them just because. Just because. Yeah. And because I created you just because, I'm yeah. going to feed the birds. Yeah. I'm going to take care of them. Yeah. And, you know, and the thing is, is, uh, and, and, and so that's, that's a statement against the effort, the human effort of it. And all, it, he, the only thing he says in that is this is what I want you to seek. I want you to seek the kingdom of God. I want you to, I want you to come after me. Yeah. And, and you I, know, and I do build think, 25 foot monoliths to yeah, me. And I just, you know, I do, I just think that that's. You know that that's, you know, what is worship like? It's oh, it's and it, it it's and a, it it's it's and we have to grant pre, people the freedom to worship. The only right. thing is, the thing is, we're not saying I'm as a Baptist minister, as a Christian pastor, and as a follower of Jesus. Please don't hear from my lips. Well, as long as you're worshiping something. No, no. I am. I yeah. am. I am. Pursue. Pursue him. Yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. Go uh, him. Go see yeah. Jesus, or let Jesus see you. Right, but no, I think what you're saying is really important because um, back to consumer Christianity, they come to are they coming to be worship or to be entertained? And so, if we're pushing on our people or encouraging them to see worship as you know as an offering, as a sacrifice, as something that is done unto the Lord that is beautiful, mm -hmm. well, then, you know, backwards S is, is it, that's worship. That's, your, that's Joel's paintings as he paints. Yeah. So <laughs> painting is clearly an expression of worship. Absolutely. Um, you can abstract it even for everyday people when you go mm -hmm. to work and you're putting your hands to your craft. Mm-hmm. If you're doing it under the Lord, that is your personal expression of worship. Yeah, I, and, I think that I'm going to simplify what I yeah. what I do as a pastor, and what I do as a preacher every yeah, Sunday. Yeah. Is here's Jesus, and what I do is, ta-da! I do that too. That's that's. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, yeah. I love, it's the yeah. it's the unveiling and I spend I spend 25 30 minutes going ta da. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, and, and I was I was even taught that in seminary or what seminary I did do. Um, is that it is our it's the preacher's job to highlight Jesus who's standing next to you and people just can't see it yet. Mm -hmm. And sometimes and, it is just two syllables. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, and I may do that sometime. I just may have Jesus is here. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Ta da. Ta da. What are you doing with it? Yeah. I love it. Wow. I okay, so I have one defining moment of when probably worship was big for me. Um, I was 10 mm -hmm. and uh, we went to a conference, a missions conference in England, Brighton, England. And this was a John Wember conference back in the day. Mm -hmm. So it was back in the eighties and it was in Brighton beach and it was in a round auditorium. Mm -hmm. And uh, worship was very unique and special back then. It, mm -hmm. it, it changed. Uh, it was, like the, the atmosphere of it was here I am Lord a broken and contrite heart mm -hmm. so it was it was worship but the tone and direction of that worship was um, a little internal which was the right thing for that time mm -hmm. so that was kind of the tone of a vineyard worship it was a little introspective but that's what it needed to be at that time mm -hmm. very powerful very transformative transformational uh, and I remember so this this auditorium around auditorium thousands of people inside and um, I just I just remember it vividly I remember it I could see it I could feel it so it's still like 
branded into my brain this moment. But we were worshiping, and um, yes, we can connect with God and worship at any given time, at any given Sunday. He's there. He's always speaking. He's always there for everyone. And yet, in my opinion, there are certain moments when God is moving in different ways where his spirit is pouring out mm -hmm. in uniqueness. Mm -hmm. And there's defining moments where big mm -hmm. things happen. Um, this was a big moment. And I just, you could see this, and, and it was, you know, at worship, you know, let's worship, you know, come Holy Spirit. That, mm -hmm. That's what basically was said. Mm -hmm. And you could just see the Holy Spirit fall on this round auditorium and just flow all the way down from the top to the mm -hmm. bottom, and there was a physical reaction to the people when the Holy Spirit fell upon them. You know, some started crying, some started laughing. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a delegation of witches and warlocks that came in to disrupt the service. Wow. So when the Holy Spirit came down and people were responding emotionally, when it hit those people, I mean, it was like instant deliverance and. Wow. It was, you know, it was weird. And then it just passed them and went down to the whole auditorium. And that's what I remember as being wow. worship. And yeah, you, those... you, you could not, like, you know, you could not help but to not yeah. worship. Like You Pentecostals have all the fun. I, well, <laughs> I you know it. what, though? I think, you know, and just being around you and your experience, there is no label to it. There's when, no label. When God there moves. There is. I mean, it's... And there's, you know, we'll just say you, there's spirit-filled Baptists, there's spirit-filled Catholics. Absolutely. There's spirit-filled, you know... You, you, God has this for everybody, and you yeah. never know when it's going to come, but he, yes. has, he has moments. He's going to bring you to that place where I don't care if you are... If you're putting your... Your hands in his wounds. Yeah. But you're going to say, My Lord and, and my God. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. And that's, you know, and so, and that, when those lips come out, when that comes out of your lips, yeah. God says, Well done, good and faithful servant. Yeah, I love that. I love that, Thomas. I love I mean, that. You know, you, the doubting Thomas, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, he worshipped in that moment, right? At that moment, I so mean, I, my Lord and my yeah, God. Yeah. And I mean, what a gift yeah. Jesus gave him. He says, "Put your hands in my wounds." Yeah. But it's fascinating. I don't know if he didn't do it though, right? Like he was told to do it, but I don't. I don't. We'll have to research. But I don't think in the in the notes he actually says that he. Thomas then put his fingers in his. Put side. your hand in my. What if yeah. I think it was this? Yeah. I think. Give me your hand. Yeah. I think. Put your finger. Yeah. I'm Thomas, real. Put put your finger. Yeah. Put it in my side. Yeah. yeah. I I in my imagination I see him I see him physically taking Dude, doing Thomas. It. Yeah. You know and going. Let's yeah I'm real. My Lord and my yeah, God. My Lord my God. All right. Let's be done. Thank you guys for listening and watching. What a blessing. Uh, yeah, it's been a blessing that we get to talk this stuff out. We hope that it was a blessing to you. We hope that it encouraged your faith. Uh, we hope that it encourages your perspective on worship. Uh, you are made to worship. There's no getting around it. And uh, God's not dependent upon you for worship. Your worship doesn't make him stronger or better or weaker. Um, but all creation. It's all creation. Go to worship. Just want to also thank... Um, our tech team, yeah, yeah. our uh, Luke and Joel, for uh, just making us look good. Yeah, yeah, making us sound good. And so, and and um, and my appreciation to um, to Josh and to Granite Creek Studios Yay. for letting us be here with you from time to time. Awesome. All right, the next one's going to be good. See you soon. <laughs>